And, 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 as, and as Dr. Watson said, um, we, we, we've been, most of us been preaching to empty sanctuaries anyway, so we ain't even phased. They'll get here when we get here. Praise God, everybody. It, it, is anybody hungover from yesterday? Oh, my God. Is anybody hungover from yesterday? Is anybody uh, redemptively drained from this whole week? Man, I, I told someone, I am exhaustedly exhilarated. God has done remarkable things. Um, I, I, I want to say this as we move into today, this final day. Um, I, I try to spend quality time in prayer. In fact, probably my, probably my uniqueness is that I'm a mystic in many ways. I was raised by a woman spiritually who was a mystic but didn't know what that meant. Her understanding of God influenced me in really profound ways. So I believe in the necessity of prayer. Not, not just the power of prayer, but the necessity of prayer, which for me cultivates personal worship. And so I believe in the power of worship. And anything that I connect to is going to at least attempt to be worshipful whether it's my church and even now us. And it was interesting when the week started, you know, my prayer was, Lord, refresh us and revive us and create a sense of reimagination in each of us. The Lord made me a promise because when I walked in here 17, 18 months ago, 16 months ago, whatever, I felt us as alumni wounded and many far too disconnected. I felt that our school as a whole had been through some trauma itself and leadership had felt unsure. And my prayer was God heal us. And yesterday, the way we honored Dean Kenny, okay, the elephant in the room needs to be destroyed. <laughs> yesterday, the way we honored Dean Kenny can I declare over the School of Theology since I am uh, the dean, which, which as Dr. Smith said to me my first week, our school needs a pastor that comes with being the dean. I want to declare that we are whole and healthy and alive and well. Okay, anybody going to agree with me? We are healthy and whole and alive and well. To God be the glory. And so as we enter this last day, uh, and, and all of us scatter, whether it's across the street or across the country, some have already returned or have begun their return. Thursday is always kind of that day that people start returning home. But however and for whatever, we're going to end this strong. So if you don't mind, would you stand? And let's just give God great praise. As our worship leader comes, Minister Bobby Newell, as he comes and we get ready for the word of God today from Dr. Lance Watson. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Our Lord's name is worthy to be praised. Come on, somebody, you could praise him on today. We've been in convocation all week. You've been here since Monday now to Thursday. You better praise his holy, his righteous, his majestic name, somebody. Because he is good and his mercy endures forever. You open your Bibles with me real quick to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. The 43rd chapter. Verse, reading from verse 18 to 20. And it reads as such. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to new, do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do not perceive it. Do you not perceive it? 
I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. If you bow with me for a little bit and for a word of prayer. Gracious, everlasting, eternal, wise God, we come right now to say thank you. Thank you for waking us up this morning, oh God, and thank you for allowing us to press our way out to 1500 North Lombardi Street, oh God. Thank you, oh Father God. Thank you for the Ellison Jones Convocation, oh God. Thank you for the mighty words that we heard. Thank you for everything, oh Father God. But Father God, we're standing in the need of prayer, oh Father God. Refresh us, renew us, and revive us, oh Father God. Allow your Holy Spirit to stop by 1500 North Lombardi Street, oh Father God, that we may feel and experience the true and the living God. So, Father God, have your way, O oh God. Arrest us in the midst of worship as the people who come to preach your word, O oh God. Allow your Holy Spirit to arrest us in this midst of this morning worship experience, O oh Father God. And we'll be careful to give your name all the glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Praise the Lord, everybody. All week long, we've been in the presence of the Lord, and this is just another opportunity to give the Lord praise. It's another opportunity to give the Lord worship. How many are glad that the Lord has made a way for us? Time after time, day after day, moment after moment, the Lord has shown himself to be consistent, to be a way maker. How many can praise God for the ways? As I look back over my life, think things over, I can truly say I've been blessed. My testimony is that God is a way maker. My testimony is that God is consistent. My testimony is that God can make a way out of no way. He can open doors no man can shut. He can shut doors no man can open. And he's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be glorified. He's worthy to be lifted. Lord, we bless you today, we bless you today, oh God, we sing you made a way, when our back were against the wall, and it looked as if it was over, you made a way. And we're standing here only because you made a, oh, you made a way. When our back was against the wall and it looked as if it was over, you made a way. Oh, God, and we're standing here only because, can you sing with us, Ellis and Jones, say you. When our back was against the wall, and it looked as if it was glory to God, glory to God. And we're standing here. i 
Yes, he is. He's my boy. 
Amen. Amen. Yeah, that looks better. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, we, we have been very strategic all week, and, and I genuinely believe that this has been uh, the orchestration of God. Every presenter, every singer, these young people, haven't they been amazing? Can, can we celebrate them? Come on, come on. We, we complain about young people, but when God gives us And what's been really powerful is that they have stayed through almost every worship experience. I mean, they're students. They got to go to class. And so thank you. Thank you, awesome young ladies. And said so thank you all for just being here. They're going to come back one more time um, um, just to set the atmosphere for the preacher. Uh, I'm grateful for this man. He is, of course, like everyone, he's, he's union. Right? Some people are union-ish. He's union, right? And so we're grateful to have Dr. Lance Watson here. He, you know, all of us are aware of his voice. And uh, we, we thank God for him. I, I do want everybody to write down a date. I want you to write down a date. November 13th through the 16th. November 13th through the 16th. We will return to Ellison Jones. I think... There's some folk that didn't come this year. I think some folk gonna come next year that didn't come this year. Uh, the, the, I, I, I don't know if you've gotten feedback, but I've been hearing folk, I've been hearing the buzz of what, of what people have witnessed and even what we've witnessed here. So please go back and do a couple of things. One, go back and, and invite your, your classmates, uh, those who graduated with you, invite them to come home. Amen. Invite them to come home. And then secondly, help us with recruiting. Uh, not just for the MDiv and the D-Men and soon the MAR and soon the PhD. And soon the PhD. Which no doubt has been a dream of others. And, um, and, uh, but it is now in the works. And, and Dr. Smith, um, I'm, a, I'm a leader who believes in empowering people who can do it far better than you. And Dr. Smith has been leading us in this PhD development work. Can we give great praise for Dr. Sylvester Smith? Uh, he's an amazing man. He's a Cowboys fan. And he pledged the wrong fraternity. Amen. But if God took him, I would be highly upset. I would be highly upset. So, so we want to make sure that November 13th through the 16th, the plan is to be back on campus one more year. I want to make sure that next year we're standing around the walls as we once did. And so we're excited about that. So please, November 13th through the 16th. And for students, I believe it's the fourth weekend in March of 2023, we will have our, our spring community formation. Um, because students aren't coming on campus, you know, as previously, because we don't, we're not doing a lot of in-person anything, really, in the School of Theology yet, um, except for the class that Dean Kenny will teach. Uh, <laughs> and, and Dean, I need to have a five-minute conversation with you about a possible idea, okay? So, but so for all of you who are students, um, and we'll make, I'll make sure that we have the correct date, but the fourth weekend, I believe in March of 23, we will have our community, our spring community formation. The goal is to meet twice a year since we're almost 100% virtual. It's good to come to campus. Um, so some of you came to campus and it changed you. You, you. you now get what union is about. So we're going to do it twice a year, and that'll give you a time to engage faculty and, and kind of get a sense of what it means. So we'll, we'll make sure that you have that information. All right, so, so let's give God great praise as they come and then the amazing man of God comes to preach to us today, Dr. Lance Watson. Okay, thank you, baby. Simple song of worship, it says, all praises be to the King of kings and the Lord. Yeah. 
No music. Let's do it together. Come on, say it. To the king of kings and the Lord. Let's go. One more time. Say your praises. To the king. King of kings. your hands together and praise the Lord like you love him. Pray with me right where you are. God, we shout hallelujah today for you are worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, your name is worthy. So we bless you, we honor you, we praise you, and we thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you for the Ellison Jones convocation. Thank you for every participant in it, for every person who has shared these moments, whether in person or virtually, we give you the honor and the glory. And we pray now as we turn our attention to your word that you would speak to us at the point of our need, that we might leave different than we came in the name of Jesus. And all the people shouted, amen. What a joy, what an honor. You may be seated to be here with you today. 
help you to celebrate our Dean, Dean John Guns. Praise God for him. And then praise God for our forever Dean, Dean John Kenny. And to all of the professors and faculty and staff, to all of the persons who have preceded me on the program this week, to all of the students, all of the alumni, this wonderful singing group who has serenaded our souls with the songs of praise, and to all of you, the people of God, it is good to be here. There's something about the grounds of Virginia Union that remind us of what it means to be in sacred space. But God has done so much for so many of us in these spaces and places. And Virginia Union for me is now about legacy because I've had the opportunity, I was taught New Testament by Dr. Boink and Sanders, Old Testament by Dr. Jerome Ross, I was taught systematic theology by Dr. John Kenny, and all of them then taught my son who matriculated in the MDiv program. So I am eternally grateful to the School of Theology and to Virginia Union for how you have contributed to my life. I want to share with you that today is a healing for me. I was invited to preach the Ellison Jones Convocation several years ago. I think it was 2017 and was preparing to do that and ended up undergoing a six hour surgery because my entire left side was paralyzed because of an injury to my neck. So I wasn't able to do it, but God has a way of bringing things back around. And so we praise God for this opportunity to share with you today. And I'm not gonna keep you long. I wanna thank God for all of my sons and my daughters who are in the ministry, who are here today. I wanna acknowledge their presence. And uh, so, so that I don't get on the wrong side of the tracks, I want to acknowledge not only my alpha brothers, but all the divine nine. Amen. Because, you know, grace is an important part of our faith. And for, <laughs> for those of you who didn't pledge alpha, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, but... <laughs> but God is good and greatly to be praised. And there's a text that I'd like to share, so travel with me to the textual territory that is 1 Samuel chapter seven. I'd like to read in your hearing just verse 12, and this is how it reads from Eugene Peterson's message translation. It says, Samuel took, then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mitzvah and Jeshana. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. For he said, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. And all the people said, amen. amen. That's what we want to talk about for a few moments, up to this point. This year, of course, we celebrate the 73rd anniversary of the Ellison Jones Convocation. For 73 years, God has led us by his grace. And today, this week, we have been adding our sentences to a story that is still being told. Up to this point, through prayer and persistence, struggle and sacrifice, God has kept us and we are glad. We are glad to remember the legacy of Dr. John Malchus Ellison and Dr. Miles Jerome Jones, whose academic prowess, intellectual acumen, and rigorous commitment to education set the stage upon which we serve. We are glad to recollect the presidents and deans and professors and staff and students whose persistent participation and matriculation have perpetuated this consecrated space for us to gather and contemplate the high and holy calling to which we have been collectively summoned. 
we are glad for all the ways God has made, all the doors God has opened, all the battles God has fought, all the tuition God has paid, all the storms God has come, all the sickness God has healed, all the burdens God has lifted, all the lives that God has touched, and all the souls that God has saved. God has been good to us. And I'm glad to announce that the best is still yet to come. This 73rd anniversary is notable because it coincides with something more significant. For this year also commemorates the 403rd year since 20 Africans from what is now Angola were brought in chains on a slave ship called the White Lion to Port Comfort which is now Fort Monroe in Hampton, Virginia. This was one full year before the arrival of the pilgrims on the Mayflower, 113 years before the birth of George Washington, and 157 years before the official formation of this nation. These 20 Africans sold for food and brought to English North America signaled the start of the transatlantic slave trade in the English colonies. These 20s were not the first people of African descent to arrive in what is now called the United States because Africans were documented in the ancient history of Native Americans, the British colony of Bermuda, and in the records of Spanish American colonies like then Florida and South Carolina. But it's sobering to think of how long the issues of race and racism have been a part of our national fabric. The reality that this happened 113 years before George Washington was born alerts us to the fact that the enslavement of Africans was the ambiotic fluid out of which this republic was birthed. It also helps us to understand how the founders could write such noble documents like the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and yet at the same time hold title to African slaves. It explains how in 1787, in an attempt to determine taxation and representation, among the colonies, the three-fifths compromise was written into the Constitution designating Africans and the Americans to be only three-fifths of a human being. Human enough to count them when determining the number of representatives a state may have, but not human enough to tax slaveholders for possessing them. According to UNESCO, the transatlantic slave trade was unique in the history of the globe for at least three reasons. Number one, its length. It lasted 400 years. Number two, its labeling. It targeted black African men, women, and children. And number three, its legitimization achieved by manipulating the law through black codes and corrupting the church through the misinterpretation of scripture. It involves several continents, Africa, North, South, and Central America, Europe, and the Caribbean. It was the first system of globalization. It's estimated that 25 to 30 million people were deported under duress from their homes and sold as slaves, with 17 million being forcibly funneled into the North American system. And that only accounts for those that survive the vile voyage of the Middle Passage. It was the largest deportation in history. The overwhelming majority of African Americans today owe our existence to somebody who was captured on the continent, loaded on a ship, endured the middle passage, was sold as shadow slavery, endured ineffable horrors, and yet did not lose hope. What a unique intersection of anniversary celebrations. And as I prayed for a word that would speak to such a moment of weighty particularity, this text spoke to me. Up to this point, the Lord has helped us. As we contemplate our individual and collective context as a person who himself 
whose DNA traces to Cameroon on my mother's side and Portugal on my father's side. That means in order for me to be here, my mama's mama's generations removed had to survive the hideous horror of abduction, navigate the gruesome nightmare of the Middle Passage, and suffer the circuitous jeopardy of being forcibly enslaved, desperately clinging to the hope that the Lord will help us. And that's enough for me to shout for the next 10 years, because when you think about it statistically, none of us should be here right now. Our ancestors should not have survived what they survived, and yet they did because the Lord helped them. This powerful pericope before us is part of the historical narrative of the ancient Hebrews. It is a historical bridge between the judges and the kings. It depicts a moment where Samuel, as the last judge, the Nagid in Israel, was seeking to bring them back from the edge of anarchy, back from the perilous period when everybody did what was right in their own eyes, back from the rascality and dysfunction to the way and the will and the word of God. And can I suggest to you that our time increasingly is becoming similar to Samuel's day? Because ours is a time of blurred lines, fake news, alternative facts, slanted standards, and diminished distinctions. Like Israel then, we often now have a laissez-faire attitude towards that which is holy. And if I have one admonition today for those of you who share the cloth and the calling of the cloth with me, it is this. Resist the temptation to permit holy things to become common in your hands. Something should be sacred in your life. Israel had been given the Ark of the Covenant more than just a carrying case for the commandments that Moses had received in the smoking summits of Sinai. It was a sacred artifact meant to symbolize the presence of God. They tried to use the Ark to manipulate both God and reality according to their own whims and desires. But in chapter four, God checks them by allowing the Philistines to decisively defeat them and capture the ark. Can I stick a pin right there? Don't make God have to check you. Don't play God cheap. Don't mistake God's kindness for weakness or God's love for lenience. Don't snub your nose at God's will, God's word, God's plan, or God's presence because your arms are too short to box with God. Let me say it like this. You got to check yourself so you don't wreck yourself. The ark was captured and the Philistines modeled the manipulation of the Israelites trying to use the ark like a magical charm. But to their shock and surprise, they experienced months of pure heartache as God made it plain to them that God cannot be managed. God is unmanageable. Did you hear what I said? Because that's at the heart of what it means to say that God is sovereign. They may have captured the ark, but they had not contained and did not control Almighty God. God was greater than their idols and mightier than their maneuvers. Weary of misfortune, they returned the ark to Israel on a new ox cart. It was taken to the house of Abinadab, and it was from there that Samuel led the people to repent and turn from their idols. But while they were in worship, the Philistines attacked them again, thinking that their worship posture made them vulnerable. They didn't realize that one of the most powerful places and postures that any child of God could assume is the posture of worship and praise. Marvin Sapp sang it this way, I've had my share of ups and downs, times when I felt no one was around. God came and spoke these words to me, praise will confuse the enemy. But when we praise, God provides, God protects, and God preserves. Is there a witness in this room? They were in worship but attacked, and you will be too. So stop thinking of the churches that you serve as cruise ships when in reality they are battleships. 
we gather, not just to be encouraged by a blessing, that's one part, but also to be equipped for battle because there's a war going on. Churches are not spiritual spies. They are spiritual command centers. They were attacked in worship, but God responded by sending a storm so severe that it sent the Philistines into a panic and enabled Israel to rout them. In the aftermath of such an incredible victory, Samuel erected a stone in their midst and named it Ebenezer, announcing up to this point, the Lord has helped us. Samuel celebrates the Lord's help, assistance, protection, provision, and defense. Now don't miss this. The consistent witness of scripture is that God helps those who trust in God. And there ought to be a witness on your row who will co-sign this affidavit with me that God helps those who trust in God. Psalm 33:20. the songwriter said, we wait in hope for the Lord for he is our help and our shield. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The prophet Samuel understood that, so he said out loud up to this point, the Lord has helped us. And that alone is a reason to celebrate. Can I tell you why? I won't keep you waiting. I'll keep rolling. Because first of all, it speaks to us of the duration of the Lord's help. Everybody say duration. How long has the Lord helped you? up to this point. Samuel understood that what had just taken place was just one scene in the continuous drama of God's program of deliverance. They were living in a continuum of amazing grace. Samuel could appreciate God's present help in light of God's prior help. The God who had helped them this time is the same God who had been helping them all the time. For as long as they had been alive, for as long as they had been a people, the Lord had helped them from one generation to another in good times and bad, in great moments and uncertainty, the Lord had helped them. In fact, Moses testified in Psalm 90, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. From the call and promise made to Abraham, to the 400 years in Egypt, to the 40 years wandering in the wilderness, to the hundreds of years during which they occupied the land of promise, God had helped them. The duration of time had not been an issue for God. God's help had been consistent. God had not been more help at some time and less help at another, for God's facility and capacity had not been diminished by the passing of time. God had been all the help God had ever been at all times, for God is eternal and everlasting. God is unchanging and unstoppable. God is what and who God was and is and will be who God has always been. Up to this point, the Lord has helped us as African Americans. From the time prior to our captivity on the continent of Africa, across the Atlantic Ocean, amid 400 years of slavery and dehumanization, through lynching, reconstruction, Jim Crow, the KKK, segregation, intimidation, discrimination, incarceration, gerrymandering, and redistricting, the Lord has helped us. The Lord has helped each generation, bridgers, boomers, busters, and millennials, Gen Y, X, and Z. God's help has been total and complete. Even as we contemplate our collegial history together, as we remember the hope of the American Baptist Home Missionary Society, who in 1865 founded a school to educate those newly emancipated from the nadir of human slavery, we can testify at Virginia Union that the Lord has helped us. Think of the duration of your family. Go back as far as you can and see how the Lord has defended, helped, and provided for your family. Think of your life. Scamper across the decades before 
you were a sparkle in your father's eye or a thought in your mother's mind. Before you were a protoplasmic substance making your way up a fallopian tube in the intimacy of your mother's womb, revisit your childhood when you could have died from a thousand different diseases. Then visit your adolescence when the blood was dancing in your veins and you had more energy than you had common sense. Why were you not destroyed? The Lord helped you. From the earliest of your existence up until this present time, the Lord has helped you. I only need about 12 of you. I'll make 13. Oh, look at your neighbor and say, the Lord has been helping me. There's been no time span outside of the Lord's help. No time too long, no time too hard, no time too strenuous for the Lord. The Lord has helped you every time. Up to this point, not only speaks of the duration of the Lord's help, but also to the distance covered by the Lord's help. If you don't mind, look at somebody and say, we've come a mighty long ways. And listen to this, God has brought us all the way. How far had the Lord helped them? Well, their story starts in Haran, where God called Abraham to leave what he knew and go to a land yet undesignated. Abraham packed his things and left, not knowing where he was going, but landed in a place called Canaan. The journey across generations would lead them into Egypt, then out again through the wilderness, back into Canaan, then into Assyria, Babylon, and Persia, and ultimately, back to Jerusalem. Consider the distance of the Lord's help for us from the shores of Africa to the coasts of mid-Atlantic to fields of labor throughout the south through the migration to northern cities and towns and then back down south. The Lord has helped us as was the case collectively. So the case for us collegially. The Lord has helped us. There is no distance that we've had to travel that God has not helped us from California to Connecticut, from Michigan to Maine, from Arkansas to Florida, from Kansas City to North Carolina, from all over these yet to be United States, the Lord has helped us in every place along the length of our journey. The Lord has helped us as far back as we can remember. The Lord has helped us and as far ahead as we can imagine, the Lord will be our help. In fact, did you know the Lord is helping you right now, loving you right now, healing you right now, preparing you right now, lifting you right now, opening doors for you right now? The whole preacher said he woke you up this morning and started you on your way. The Lord is blessing you right now. There has been no space we were ever in, no problem that we've ever faced, no need that we've ever had, no battle that we've ever fought where the Lord has not helped us. God did not help you to get this far just to leave you now. Can we shout about that point? Because wherever you are and wherever you're going, God is already there. You will never go where God is not. For God still is where God used to be while already arriving where God is headed while still remaining where God was. God has helped you. The songwriter of Israel tried to wrap his mind around this idea when he wrote Psalm 139 saying, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me. There is no place you can go where God is not. And since God is there, God's help will be there as well. Think about the distance you've covered. Think about how you began. Think about how much ground you've covered, how many storms you've endured, how many adversaries you've faced, how many valleys you've walked, how many miles 
miles you've covered. How many dark days and lonely nights and tear-filled moments and agonizing heartbreaks you have already come through. The Lord has been helping you. Look at how far you've come from the projects, from the hood, from the farm, from the fields, from the struggle, from the depression, from the disappointment, from the abuse, from the addiction, from the ghetto, from the penitentiary, from the street. You have come a mighty long ways. Don't get it twisted. We know you have always been where you are right now. Tell the truth and shame the devil. You haven't always been big balling and shot calling. You have not always been tree shaking and jelly making. Think about how far mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially you've come. You should testify to two or three people right now. Just say, God has brought me a mighty long ways. If you only knew the distance that I've come, you would understand why I praise God the way I do. If you only knew how down I was, how out I was, how broken I was, how humiliated I was, how frustrated I was, how alone I was, and nobody but the Lord helped me, you'd understand my prayer. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, I've got to cry hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shake your head at somebody and say, you weren't there. See, you looking at me right now, but you don't know anything about my back then. Back then, they didn't know me. Now that I'm blessed, they all up on me. That's some Mike Jones theology. Up to this point, the Lord has helped me. See, that praise speaks of the duration and the distance of the Lord's help, but also the deliverance given through the Lord's help. This passage in its context reveals two types of difficulty overcome with the Lord's help. The first type of difficulty was that created by the people themselves. Now, this is the silent section of the sermon because here's the fact. Some of the difficulties we have are difficulties we created for ourselves. Israel's history, like ours, was filled with self-created difficulties. It started with Abraham lying about Sarah, Isaac lying about Rebekah, Rebekah's favoritism toward Jacob, and Isaac's favoritism towards Esau, Jacob's trickery, Joseph's tattling, the brother's jealousy, the people's impatience with Moses up on the mountain, the people's doubt in the face of the giants, Achan's taking what was forbidden, the people's idolatry creating the difficulty that they experience with the Philistines. But there's a shout here because even while they were outside of God's will, God navigated around their self-created difficulties to help them get the victory anyway. Israel didn't return to the Lord until chapter 7 of 1 Samuel, but God had already worked in chapter 6. And I'm preaching to somebody, y'all know who this is for, who is struggling this morning in your own self-created chapter 6. And God sent me to encourage you not to give up because although you're not going to get it together until chapter 7, God is already fixing it in chapter 7 while you still in chapter 6 because the Lord had already gotten it together while at the same time helping them to get together. I hear Paul writing to the church at Philippi, it is God working in you both to will and to do what pleases him. By God's help, they were able to overcome the difficulty they created for themselves and throughout our collective history there have been difficulties that we have created for ourselves can we be honest if you trace it back there were tribes on the continent of Africa who sold their own in the slavery that self-created difficulty the crab in the barrel mentality which draws energy from our insecurity and finds the need to attack others who are perceived to have moved to too far ahead. That's self-created difficulty, a scarcity mentality that causes us to withhold help from others out of the erroneous belief that if we help them, we won't have enough for ourselves. That's self-created difficulty because we kill each other. We sell drugs to each other. We turn on each other. We abandon each other. We fail to support our own institutions. We boycott our own business. 
businesses. We poison the minds of our young with hypersexualized, misogynistic images and lyrics that glamorize violence and denigrate women and reduces sexual intimacy to an itch that needs to be scratched. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy, and yet, despite all of that, the Lord has helped us. The Lord has helped us to discern good from bad, right from wrong, healthy from harmful, the life-giving from the destructive. The Lord has helped us to see the right path, choose the right way, stay on the wrong, right road, teach the right things, get clean and stay clean, get free and stay free, get right and stay right. And in some cases, the Lord has helped you to stand all by yourself, to stand alone, stay alone, walk alone, live alone, fight alone, but know you're never alone because the Lord has been with you every step of the way. The Lord has helped you turn around, turn back, turn from, turn to. The Lord has helped you repent, return, regain, restore, renew, revive, and resurrect. I wonder, is there anybody here who will admit honestly that you have jumped the rail a couple of times, but you can shout because he led you back to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. See, if you can't deal with the truth about anybody else, you got to deal with the truth about yourself. You got to be able to look at yourself and say, I caused this mess. That's one type, self-created difficulty, but the second type is difficulty created by others. And I'm still in the text because just as the people are repenting, while they're in the midst of worship, I told you they're adversaries attack them. And as people of color, we have been under attack for hundreds of years in this country alone. And that's why I spend no energy, Dr. Sanders, and no time with people who say, that happened a long time ago. Why don't you just forget about it and move on? I can't forget it because it did happen. and It is happening, and it will continue to happen if we forget it. Preach like I'm doing the best I can. Families were split and separated, huddled together like livestock, placed on the auction block, sold as property to be mortgaged, insured, collateralized for loans, traded like a commodity, worked like oxen, hounded like dogs, beaten like strays, wives raped, husbands lynched, or bred like animals, children sold like commodities. And then there was Jim Crow where we were denied basic privilege and in the struggle to obtain them, we were lynched and maimed, bombed and bitten by dogs and murdered. We have suffered through substandard schools and outdated books and teachers with low expectations. But up to this point, speaks to the deliverance given by the Lord's help. Nobody knows like you know the degree of difficulty you've had to overcome in your life. Nobody knows like you know what you've suffered, what you've lost, how you've struggled, how you've fought, how you've cried, how you've scuffled. Nobody knows the illness, the sickness, the diagnosis, the chemo, the dialysis, the medication, the surgeries, the ailments that you have had to endure. Nobody knows the rejection and the desertion, the molestation, the denial, the betrayal, the depression, the doubts, the fears that you have had to endure, the letdowns, the layoffs, the put-downs, the shutdowns. Nobody knows the abuse that you've endured, physical abuse, verbal abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. Somebody here knows what it is to take comfort in Psalm 86, 16, which says, turn to me and have mercy on me. Show me your strength, God. Give me a sign of your goodness so that my enemies will see it and be put to shame. For you, God, have helped me and comforted me. Who am I preaching to now? Because up to this point, the Lord has helped all of us when we were helpless. He sent us some help. And just in case you're wondering, I don't want to be ambiguous. His name is Jesus. He died for us. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. He helped us by being wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, taking the 
chastisement or the penalty for our peace upon his person so that by his stripes we are healed. He lived our life. He died our death. He went to hell on our behalf. And on the third day, God raised him up. He's helping us right now at the right hand of God where he's making intercession for us. And I'm so glad that when I was helpless, the Lord was helping me. He kept helping me and calling me until one day I heard his voice and I came to Jesus just as I was weary, worn, and sad. And I found in him a resting place and he has made me glad. Up to this point, the Lord has been helping me and because he has, I can declare in faith he will. He will send help. He will be help. He will give help. In every place the Lord has helped me. In every dilemma the Lord has helped me. With every enemy the Lord has helped me. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat of my flesh, God stuck out his foot and they stumbled and fell. Thank you, Lord, for helping me. Has the Lord helped you? I know it's early, but will you thank him? Will you praise him? Will you bless him? Because the Lord will help you. In fact, somebody ought to tell your neighbor, I've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. And just in case they're weary, would you touch them on the elbow and say, I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far, struggled too hard, cried too long, prayed too much to give up now. Nobody told me that the road would be easy, but I don't believe he brought me this far just to leave me now. Good morning, STVU. May the Lord bless you real good. But as I close this message, can I give you one more thing? It reminds me of a story that a colleague of mine by the name of Stephen Carter shared with me on one occasion when I was talking to him about having confidence in God. He said, well, you know, I went to Harlem Hospital to visit one of my members and I got on the elevator and there was a gorgeous African-American Nubian sister standing on the elevator in scrubs. He said, I was amused and curious uh, watching her standing there. So I struck up a conversation and said, hello, ma'am, how are you? She responded, I'm fine. He said, well, who are you? Uh, and what do you do? Uh, she said, I am a cardiologist uh, at this hospital. But then she added, but I'm no ordinary cardiologist. He was curious about a remark and said, who are you? She said, I'm the one they call when all the other cardiologists have failed. Then she turned to him and said, and who are you? And what do you do? He said, I'm the one they call. I work for the one they call when you fail. That when doctor fails, when lawyer fails, when mother fails, when father fails, I know somebody who will never let you down. His name is Jesus. Can I say it like I feel it? I don't want to be disrespectful. I know I'm on a collegiate campus, but can I say it like I feel it? Ain't he all right? Say yeah. Say yeah. He'll help you. Wow. Up until this point. I, I, I can't take no more. Can we give God great praise for that? Dr. Lance Watson. Wow. 
up until this point. Wow. Wow. Has the Lord, the Lord decided to bless us this week? No, the Lord decided <laughs> to speak to us and encourage us and inspire us, and revive and refresh us. Okay, our morning is tight, so we're going to take five minutes. Our, our faculty presenter will, will come because we have to begin the university chapel service at 11, and our students who will join us will need to be out of the experience by noon uh, because that's the schedule on Thursdays. Our dean of chapel is here and uh, he will lead us in our university chapel experience. It's good to see so many of you. Last year, it was maybe, I don't know. So this has been a great year. I am encouraged. Let me share this. We are going to open registration for next year, um, probably in the next week or so, and it will be an early bird discount. We are gonna raise the price because this is a good product. Oh no, this room just left. But well, you know, the Lord loves you so much until when you need to pay the registration, he will bless you up to that point. And just for the sake of clarity, I don't know where Dr. Watson is um, when he did his whole alpha thing. The interesting thing is that, is that Dean Kenny is a Kappa and Dean Guns is a Kappa, take a five minute break.